Warriors. How about that Tiger Woods? Huh? So you guys have heard me talk about perseverance for a while. <clears throat> Tiger definitely exemplified it in spades, don't you think? So for those of you who are looking towards a long-term trading career, perseverance is a key ingredient. Without it, uh, the first period of adversity, you're going to fold. Okay. So what's even more interesting about Tiger is he was on top. You're old, not that long term. Okay, Craig. So it's even more difficult. And I've known traders that were big, huge, successful traders that went into a period where, you know, it, it turned out terrible for a while. Okay. And uh, one of the biggest S&P deck holders and traders on the floor uh, is still doing it, even though there's not much of a floor. And for years, a guy used to trade 100 lots without blinking an eye is trading ones and twosies. And you know what? He could have a green jacket one day, too, because he's persevering. So uh, that was really an inspiring real-life lesson in persevering, uh, not being worried about uh, what people say about you. Uh, people were writing Tiger off for a long time. Even Tiger was writing himself off for a while, whether or not he could play again. So I believe it was a great real-life example of not giving up, and that's a key ingredient, not, in, in, not only in trading, but almost any endeavor in life. Not that I've never given up, okay? But an example. So let's, uh, enough of the uh, homily from Dale, Father Dale. Um, I'm taking a shot up here in Aussie Kiwi, not because I'm bearish. You know, we were talking about it down here. Blake caught it here. We, uh, the, the whole chat room was short Kiwi on the central bank. And, you know, I, I thought eventually we could go to 107 and maybe we will, but I'm just thinking, you know, a lot of people have gotten on the train, uh, since this key day, this was the central bank day. And really, uh, we haven't had any type of fib rec uh, retracement at all. It's just been grinding, grinding, grinding. And right now, it looks like uh, we're getting some non-confirmations. And perhaps the people that weren't here when Forex Analytics was uh, have joined the party lately. So just looking for some type of shakeout. I would love, and I don't know if I'll, I would be able to have the patience to stay short this long, but... I would love a buying opportunity at 104.20. Hello, Hemet. How are you? So just something I'm looking at early on. Keep in mind, we have a shortened trading week with Good Friday. Yeah. That's right. Who's Aria? Who's the example, Bob? I'm not sure who you're talking about. Anyway, I'll get back to some of the analysis while Bob's answering me. So uh, back to the Dixie, you know, I've had a correction narrative working for a while. Okay. Um, I still think there's a correction underway. Uh, I think um, that we're going to take out this low or challenge a low by the end of April. Okay, of course, if you want technical confirmation, and I pointed this out Friday, I thought it might take it out. But look how we held this moving average here on the daily, the 50, and I think eventually we'll penetrate it and go the 200, which is right around the 96 level. So I would uh, sell dollar strength if it happens and manage risk over the breakout breakout this week is probably going to come in on closes over 97.40. Give me a why if you're with me, guys. You don't have to agree with me. Just want to make sure you understand uh, the whys. Okay. So if that's a scenario that I believe in, then what does it mean for the majors? 
what it means for the majors is I'd be buying breaks in Euro, you know, all the way down to maybe 1260 if uh, that opportunity presents itself. Here's, you know, this was a big area. So far we've held the 1290 level, but we could have some type of corrective pattern going on uh, for maybe a day or so little bit of dollar strength but um, I'd use that as a buying opportunity maybe about 30 to 50 lower in this range because if uh, the dollar forecast is correct then euro is going to challenge this high right the pounds leading which tells me I might have a chance to buy the uh, euro cheaper I just you know since Brexit and all the tape bombs, I guess I have an aversion to it. You know, I haven't traded Swiss in a while since they pulled the plug either. It's a long way away. What is? Oh, uh, the target in Euro? Well, it seems like that because... I am. Uh, huh? Sorry. What, Blake? Hi, Blake. Okay, uh, it's a long way away. That's because, uh, you know, the new normal has been smaller moves. But when you think about it, Gerald, um, I don't know if you're talking about what buying the dip 30 lower or so. But yeah, you know, you have to wait for good entries. Uh, it may seem like a far way away, but it's really not a long way away to buy the break. And then if the scenario plays out and we're going to uh, 114, it's really not a huge move. So even from here, it'd be 150 pips. We could get that, you know, in a few days. Okay, kind of like how we had it doing nothing, nothing, nothing. And then we had this spurt from 1250 to 1720 in a day and a half. Oh, the Dixie target's a long way away. You mean at 96? Yeah, 100 euro pips would do it and the pound holding together. You, this feels like a long way away to you, right? All right. Well, that means that if it works, there's lots of profit potential. <laughs> anyway, okay. So, uh, yen continuing. Um, you know, have this little head and shoulders breakout. Now, I think there is again short setting up, but I'm not going to do it until I see yields peak. And I think there's going to be one more peak in yields and one more decline in yields. So I think I'd wait for yen shorts, which has been correlating pretty good with yields, right? Yields going up, US dollar yen going up. I think we could get to 260, 265, and that's when I'd be looking for yen shorts. Okay. And let's see what else to cover. Uh, the crude uh, is trying to roll over, and I'll, I'll tell you why I'm not short. And I miss trades because of this, but you see this high here? And we do have. Uh, some, uh, you know, on the four hour really didn't have much divergence. Look at this, uh, uh, these two highs plus pretty high readings, but that's not the main reason. The main reason is you see this high here, it's a uh, 64, 64, right? And then we had a lower high, 64, 55. And then we had this high on Friday, 64.53. So do you think there's some buy stops over this area? Okay, the one hour uh, diverged pretty good right here. But I have a feeling that Mr. Market, and I could be wrong, maybe all those stops are safe. You know, they've survived a couple of potential retests. But I'm pretty skeptical because I think Mr. Market is a pretty mean guy, you know, and uh, he usually likes to shake out as many participants as possible, especially before a turning point, before the move happens, and most likely without those people. So uh, remaining patient uh, to short crude. Also, um, this is really going to be the deal that seals the top for crude and for me. 
it would be closing back under this wedge line, uh, which it held once right here, and the moving average. So um, that's starting to come in right around 62.50. It's attainable. So we'll see what happens if I if we don't get uh, the stop hunt, but we close back inside the formation. This is what I used to think. Oh man, I'm not going to do it here. I'm late. You know, I I shouldn't have waited for a stop hunt at 64.60. Um, you know, now I'm not going to do it because you know I've already left uh, 200 pips on the table. Well, that's not what I think now. So a throw over failure back inside the formation. I won't care if I miss the beginning of the move because some of the targets. Um, that a lot of people I respect are talking about, and there are people on the other side talking $80 oil too, okay? Uh, 70 to 80. Um, uh, but a lot of people I respect are looking for a pretty good bear move. So uh, if we close under this wedge line, the fact that I didn't get short at the top doesn't bother me like it used to when I was an uh, egomaniac, okay? Everyone with me? Enough for you to chew on before I bring in the pros. Okay. So here's one of the best pros I know, Blake, Blake Morrow, who had his mic on and told someone in his household, I I did already. No, no, no. It was actually um it was <laughs> it was uh it was somebody and I don't know what I, I I actually hit the wrong microphone button and uh it was in my office and uh oh. Okay. And, uh, we we had one of our traders from Chicago come in, and um, I was saying hello, and I hit the wrong mute button. Unmute okay, button. Buddy. Sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. You're, you're a multitasker. So I, how, yeah. how was the weekend? I know you love Tiger, not because of you know the personal life, but the same type of thing, Blake. And I know you're a golfer. Uh, how did you feel when you were? Did you it was amazing. To watch it? I actually had tears in my eyes. It was so awesome. I, you know, it, it, this is that was probably one of the true great sport comebacks of all time. I mean, I, I, I second that. You know, it it was it's amazing to see, uh, you, you know, between his 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 uh, you know his his injuries and his personal life and yeah. you know the you know the the. The, you know, people every, him off. People, everybody wrote him off. I mean, he'll never win another major. He'll never compete professionally. He'll never come back. And for him to 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 go out and do it was epic. And, and we uh, hear that from we hear that from even our loved ones sometimes. Oh, you're not going to be able to. Do uh, you know, all the voices of doubt, and even in our own heads sometimes we hear those voices of doubt. But what a great example because we all at times in our life have to make comebacks don't you think yeah yeah um all the time especially as traders yes <laughs> yeah absolutely and uh so it was a really amazing feat and and it was truly a, uh it was a, it was amazing to watch but yeah as a trader if you guys are you know ever if you ever feel beat down, I mean, that watching Tiger Woods come back and and win a major championship, and you know, and, you know, and come back after eleven years of not, I mean, he hadn't won a major since his son before his son was born, yeah. and uh, you know, to watch him on on the eighteenth, uh, you know, uh, just just you know, hug his son. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, it's just it was it's truly amazing. And, as traders, you know, we have to we have to take that and go, man. That is a truly a story of perseverance and uh, and 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 work ethic and uh, and that that's amazing because a lot of us, what happens, you know, as traders is we get beat down, and um, you know, if you just cower and you know say I can't do this and it's too hard and oh my gosh I you know you know you can and I mean I believe me I get beat down all the time and um, you know I have days and and it's it's you know the, the amount of money that I trade now is much different than you know three years ago three years ago you know if I lost two three thousand bucks I'm like wow that was a bad day you know but nowadays you know I multiply those by you know 10 
at least. And I have good days and I have bad days. And those bad days are tough days for me, you know. And when I have a, when, you know, because I'm the num the the sheer amount uh, multiplier that I use nowadays, you know, when I t when I take losses like that, I you know I, I have to I have to you know pick myself up on those days and you know come back the next day. And you know, one of the and I'll just uh, I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you guys that the, the firm that I trade for is uh, is is a small firm, very exclusive. We have very few traders, and every one of them have been recruited, and they've been uh, most. And I'm I'm the new guy on the block. Everybody else has been there for north of ten years, and um, they measure me not by the amount of money that I make, but how I. I, I react in an adverse situation, how I, you know, if I take a loss, how quickly I come back, how quickly I get my crap back together, and that's their measure of me, and because the money comes, it's, and that's, that's uh, the, and, and, you know, I've been trading now for the firm for a couple of years, and, you know, believe me, I've had my bad days, I've had, you know, horrible days. And, um, and, you know, I've obviously had good days too. So, but it's the day, it's how you come back and how you fight back as a trader. That means everything. And that, and, 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 and so if you can, you, you can watch Tiger Woods and see how he comes back after that many years of being beat down and, you know, dealing with all the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the adversities he has, um, you know, like I said, it's not just, it's not just his, his it was not just his, you know, uh, injuries. It was his personal life too. And, um, you know, he's really fought back and you have to, you have to be impressed. There's, there's, there's no doubt about it. And, and on top of that, yes, I am a golfer and I, you know, enjoy the game of golf and to see him have his, uh, have his, uh, the, his, I don't know what you call it. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the tiger esque poise that he has just, uh, it scared the crap out of the rest of the, the, uh, field too. Um, you know, you could see the, f the fear in Molinari's eyes, uh, as tiger was coming up from behind. I mean, it did, did truly, truly affected him and he, and the back nine, he just fell apart. And, um, you know, it's the intimidation factor. It's pretty amazing, guys. It, it really is. And like I said, you, know, you you may or may not be a golfer, but, you know, j you know it was pretty, pretty amazing. Anyway, um, and it was perfect to really talk about during this period of time because, really, there's not a whole lot going on. We have very tight trading ranges overnight. If you haven't noticed, uh, you look at the euro dollar. I mean, the euro dollar has had uh, a 20-some-odd pip trading range. But what I have to point out is that – the dollar is still pretty weak. You know, stocks are strong, and uh, you know, one thing before you you start going, wow, I'm gonna, I'm going to, you know, start selling or, or uh, uh, you know, I'm gonna start um, buying dollars here, and, and and picking up some dollar longs, because stocks look a little weak. They aren't. Uh, stocks are still holding up right up against their, these highs. If I was short the stock market right now, I'd be scared out of my wits. You want to see you want to see a chart that just is very glaring to me? Go look at the Aussie N. This is a multi-month breakout and it's holding. Okay? This has been this is we're at 2019 highs right now in the Aussie N and it looks like we're going higher. And so if you just think about that, that is a what in, in the FX market, that is what we look at as a risk barometer. So it 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 it, it tells you really what the you know the the um, the uh, 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 kind of breadth of the S and P is right now, and that means stocks are strong. If stocks are strong. I don't know if there's any real reason to be buying dollars right now. Okay. I, I really don't look at, you know, look at the Aussie N. And if you, if you're looking at the stock market, you're like, Oh, well, you know, the S and P is at the top of this, uh, you know, this wedge here. It is, 
And frankly, it looks like we're going to break out to the upside, you know, and until I see something really reverse here, I'm, 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 you know, I know it's everything's divergent, blah, 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 but God, it looks like the S&P can still break higher. And if it's going to break higher and you're buying dollars, you're going to probably find yourself on the wrong side. And remember, if you are fading, like let's say you're fading the dollar right now, you're, you're buying dollars, you're out there, you know, saying, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to pick up the, uh, dollar Canadian because it's cheap, or I'm going to, you know, sell the Aussie dollar because it's too expensive up here. If you're out there fading the dollar right now, don't stay wrong. It's okay to be wrong. You know, you get in, you're like, oh crap, I, you know, I'm, I'm on the wrong side. Get out quickly, but don't stick around because if you stick around based on, you know, these 20 pip trading ranges right now, and we're grinding in one direction, you know, you lose 30 pips. How are you going to make it back? All right. Take your losses quickly in this type of environment. I know we talked a lot about that over the last couple of weeks, but this is uh, it's, it's, it's very, very, very much the case right now. Now, obviously, if you guys saw the uh, week ahead videos, I'm, I am really focused on a couple of things. And let me point those out for you in the majors. I'm not going to get uh, I'm not going to get in the weeds with the the uh, the, the cross rates because I'm going to let Steve and Stelios talk about some of those. Um, but the the euro dollar at 113 um 50 sorry guys didn't mean to yawn on you but it's monday you got the case of the mondays um the euro dollar at the 113.50 that's a the, a key resistance and that i'm watching very carefully uh we get above that uh 113.50 level and yeah you, you ain't gonna want to be short the the euro i don't think uh, Morgan Stanley put out a piece this morning. This one of their trades of the week is long the euro dollar it stops below. I forget what it was, 111, some, somewhere down here. But they're looking for 118. Just FYI, um, if you look at the cable. Uh, look, guys, this is a this is a wedge, and I know we 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 probed it on Friday, but you know we start breaking above 113 or 131.40, uh, uh, and the cables gone we'll, we'll, we'll trade up towards 133 again it, it, you know and and this is a market where you have to start looking at those cascading type events and you know see if, if one starts breaking out the other one might start breaking out that type of thing the aussie is broken out and if we get above this 200 day moving average at 72 cents yeah uh being short the aussie i don't know if you really want to do that okay um Let's take a look at the Kiwi. The Kiwi dollar, I, I know I mentioned this during the uh, the week ahead video, we are, we've broken this lower trend line, but you know, in all actuality, we're still holding through support. We start getting back above uh, 68 cents, that's gonna squeeze. And you remember, I'm talking about this because the stock market is, is just continuously grinding higher and you've got the Aussie in that's breaking out. You know, it can it can drag the Kiwi higher as well. Let's take a look at the dollar Canadian. The dollar Canadian, you know, here we are near support. Dollar Canadian is one, you know, dollar pair that I would buy. It is, and I know I mentioned this during the week ahead video, it is one dollar pair I would buy if if I really want to be long dollars because it is holding up relatively well. Flip side to that is, you know, Dollar Canadian starts breaking through the 133 level. This is going to expose, you know, probably a move back to 132.50 or lower. So you got to be a little careful if you're long the dollar Canadian here. It is holding up okay, um, but like I said, uh, if the if the dollar if the dollar breaks down, it's going to break down everywhere. I think it's going to end up breaking down everywhere. Um, the dollar Mexican peso. This currency pair is extremely weak, but CFT, CFTC positioning, uh, you know, it, it, it suggests that speculators are very long pesos. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be long the dollar max right now, but I'm, I am looking for reversal signs. Uh, you know, I, I will have to see a really big reversal in the U.S. equity markets for me to you know, to start being long the dollar Mexican peso down here or even considering it. But it is something that I think we need to, you know, 
just keep in the back of our minds that the, the dollar Mexican peso, everybody's aggressively um, looking for a downside move, speculatively, looking for a downside move in the dollar Mexican peso, and the boat's a little, little uh, overweight right now. Um, I'm going to leave the Nordic currencies for Steve and Stelius, but I do want to talk about the dollar yen. The dollar yen is, and 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 um, like I said, I'm going to let uh, Steve, I'll let Steve do all the cross rates here. Um, but the dollar yen is up against some resistance, and uh, we are at the 127% extension of this last move lower. We're, we're knocking our head against it against 112.10. But notice how it's not selling off it's still holding up well. Um, the longer it sits up here, the, the higher the risk of a break of this dotted line right here, okay? The, the longer it sits here up at these prices, the more risk we are at a break above there. So as, if we can continue to consolidate it here another you know, 24, 48 hours, chances are we're going to be breaking through this 112.50 to the upside, right? So, uh, and I'm not, I'm not long. I'm just pointing out the fact that it's squeezed and it's not going down. And what does not go down probably only has one other direction to go, all right? Well, actually in this market, it could be two directions, one other one being sideways because we're obviously, we're not moving very quickly at the moment, but you know what I'm saying, okay? So uh, with that being said, I want to bring in my colleagues, Steve and Stelios. Good morning, guys. Morning, Good Mike. morning. How are you guys doing? Good. How have you been? Uh, I, I, You know, other than not wanting to get up at three o'clock this morning, I'm doing good. Uh, I definitely did. And, and by the way, there, uh, coach was around and he said something, somebody asked about Arya, uh, one of the listeners that he was referring to game of Thrones. Oh, I see. And, and having perseverance. She, and by the way, Arya is a badass. She's probably going to die a horrible death uh, at the is end. She's the queen. Uh, my, she's no, she's the youngest, uh, sister of the oh. main family, but she, she was like, was a little girl. And 10 years later, she's like an assassin. And, um, she's a warrior. Okay, and I know who you're talking about now. Yeah, I, I hope I hope the incestuous relationship doesn't have perseverance. <laughs> well, back in those times, <laughs> in those and days, sister. and I mean, you know, Greece just up until like one generation ago, very incestuous. So oh, one generation <laughs> ago. <laughs> but, but you know, the Greeks are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty. Pretty huh? not. I mean, you know, hey, I mean, you well, I think, you guys I think do Spartans and Athenians uh, intermarried. Uh, yeah, that, well, that, and, and, that and you know, I, I'm, I mean, there's some backwoods people here in the United States that do too. So I mean, whatever, okay. to each his own. <laughs> Just kidding, guys. But uh, but anyway, um, but it, that was really uh, that was a question and more of a nod to the Game of Thrones. And by the way, uh, I know a lot of people weren't happy with uh, with the first no episode. Spoiler. I know I'm not. I, I know I'm not going to spoil. But the the one thing that I will say is, uh, last season they I promised. I haven't seen last season. No spoilers. Well, no, no, no. Last season <laughs> they promised that the last this season each episode would have been 90 minutes. And there's there and and it's well known. There's only supposed to be six uh, episodes. The last there's supposed to be six more episodes in the in the this last. Uh, season, right? That's a known. That's a known fact. They're they're just wrapping up the story, right? Well, last last night's season one was only uh, sixty minutes, and I was very, I felt very, I felt very uh, um, cheated. cheated out of my <laughs> extra thirty minutes of Game of Thrones. I'm not going to uh, to, to 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 spoil anything. I thought it was good. I thought a lot of the stuff that was said needed to be said. So, uh, and I'm just going to leave it at that. So, uh, but some people were like they were disappointed with it. And I'm like, I, I wasn't. I was so excited for it to be back on though. So, it's, yeah. uh, I think I would have been happy. It's like well, remember that old skit with um, uh, Eddie Eddie Murphy, the old uh, skit where he was like eating, you know, um, um, Ritz crackers. <laughs> He's like the best damn Ritz crackers I've ever had, and he because because he hadn't had Ritz crackers in forever or was so hungry. Yeah. 
the same thing with Game of Thrones. I, I think I would have been excited about anything because I was so excited for it to come back on. So no spoilers. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, hope you guys. Well, get, uh, get on your dragon and go make money. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go do that. <laughs> so you guys, you guys have a great Monday. And remember, this is a this is a holiday week. Uh, it is Good Friday uh, observed by the, most of the Christian world, which is a, 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 a big, uh, big, big big um, majority of, of FX traders. So Friday is going to be a, a, even though the FX market will be open, no one will be around zero. So, will we? Uh, so a know, great, a great no. opportunity for manipulating the market. Eh? <laughs> it, it could be, but we won't, we will not be broadcasting because, and actually I, I think a lot of platforms, FX platforms might, might even be shut down. I mean, it's, it's so big in Europe and in the U S um, you know, Europe, it extends into an Easter Monday. They're closed. Yeah, we will be broadcasting Monday. Sorry. So, <laughs> uh, but I know, but we, we won't be broadcasting on Friday All just right. so everybody knows. All right, I'll guys. be Jones and by then anyway, Blake. So. Right. Bad, luck for, bad luck for you, coach. You're an American. Let's hold it for you. <laughs> What's that? All right, bad guys. Bad luck for you. You're an American. Let's hold it for you. No, that's bad, not money, bad, bad luck. I we I grew up in the sweet spot of the empire of the United States of America. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, by, uh, by millions of people wanted to come here, and my speaking, relatives speaking came of America, here. Before speaking him. of America, speaking of America, and um, Eddie Murphy that he mentioned before, I will always love Eddie Murphy. You know, for In for the places. movie coming coming to America, I just uh, I've watched it like I don't know 15, 20 times. I every time you know it's on somewhere, I'm gonna just you know watch it all. I can't <laughs> I, yeah, I can't get away from one. it. It's an amazing one. Yeah, honestly, it is. So, Steve, okay. what's on the radar, man? And Stell, what's on the fundamental radar? As, as it seems, first of all, Blake is not sure that uh, which one is coming to America. And for, second of all, he hasn't passed the screen. Good thing he's not <laughs> Googling. <for me. laughs> he's on the dragon. <laughs> okay, let us let me steal the screen away from here before we see something we're not supposed to. <laughs> okay, there we okay. go. All right, here. so before you I start, I mean... Have much. But I what do we have? I had a lot. I wish I had things to say, but really very little. Um, we do have the RBA minutes in about the 11 hours, I think, or something like that. So that's something to wait for. Um, uh, U.S. Empire State Manufacturing came in a few couple of minutes ago, uh, beat expectations, but really, who cares today with the uh, with the markets being as dead as they are? I think the only thing that really is worth mentioning since our last webinar is another one of Trump's tweets, which I am sure you've seen, Steve. But um, it, it was, I, I'm not sure it was an actual tweet or part of a comedy show. Because oh, it's no, no, it was, it, was it, it was a tweet and he did say, uh, and, and I quote, if the Fed had done his job properly, which it has <laughs> not, the stock market would have been five to 10,000 points higher. And, I'm uh, wondering and, if he refers to the Dow or he thinks that the S&P should the be S&P. five. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he, yeah. he did say um, quantitative tightening was a killer, should have done the exact opposite. And it scares me to hear what uh, he is, to read what he's writing. So he remains um, in, in the view that rates should be at zero or, you know, they should be doing more QE. All this on the back of an economy which is doing great. And uh, you know the economy is absolutely the best, better the than best it's ever been. Ever. It just needs yeah. zero rates and quantitative easing, according to Trump. I mean, he's, which he's is, right. Which, he, is the, he's... which is the same person. It's exactly the same person. Candidate Trump was saying that uh, this is a bubble economy. The stock yeah. market is in a bubble, and the Fed is is playing political games. Well, by... now it's his bubble. Exactly, exactly. And, by, and Stel, yeah. let me ask you, does uh, his exactly. talk and the way he wants to stack the Fed with more and the pizza guy make you want to buy more silver? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that ch- changes too, nothing. Yeah. It changes no. nothing to, to my, my long-term view. I, yeah. It changes. I, yeah. Well, if he's successful, well, it'll change plenty. And But I don't think the Fed switches gears until we have one break that takes out uh, the lows of last year and then i think they'll flip what do you think steve if that happens i think that 
we are in the last stages of a bull market that is now only based on you know uh, okay. rainbows and uni unicorns expectations now i'm talking about an a, event that'll make them is, flip. is that a timing signal no it isn't but i agree with you there will be some type of an event that will make uh, the market wake up to reality right and well, Bookbar says the Fed isn't data dependent; they're S and P dependent. That's absolutely that's absolutely certain. I mean, if you just have eyes and monitor what they've been doing, it's one hundred percent sure that they are S and P dependent. Simply, and you know something, I, I don't blame them. I don't blame them because they know better than anybody else uh, that the the only thing that keeps the economy going at the moment, besides you, you know rainbows and, and unicorns expectations, is the wealth effect. And if you take that away, um, that's it. There is nothing else uh, that's that's going to keep the economy going. This is already an extremely mature business cycle that was based, you know, um, on a huge extent on on uh, you know uh, monetary stimulus, and you know everything has ha ha you know has to come to an end, and this one will probably come to an end. That's not going to be pretty to watch, um, and you know, unfortunately for uh, you know. Once again, I, I don't have any political stakes, of course, in, in the U.S. And, the, you know, I couldn't care less. I'm neither a Democrat or a Republican. I'm just, you know, a third by, a bystander observer. Unfortunately, uh, Trump um, was voted as a person that was not a politician with whatever good that entailed. You know, that he was honest, that he was straightforward, that he was blunt many times. But, you know, that was one of his pros. And he proved to be uh, on, at, you know, on this subject another hypocrite because the exact opposite of what he was touting as a candidate, he's now saying as a president. Okay, and what has changed in between? No, absolutely nothing at all. Not that it's a surprise to me. Unfortunately, um, you know, it, it is the standard nowadays. But um, I, I think you know that uh, you know we, we've now you know seen exactly. What was his true beliefs, you know, pre-election, and you know that now what what he has done is he has em embraced the bubble, as you said, and now that it's his own, he just wants to keep it keep keep it going and keep it pumping at least until election time, 2020. Now, will they manage to keep to sustain it until election time, 2020? They will try to. Will they succeed? I don't know. My gut feeling says no, actually. So that's my point of view. And now we can go back to the to the charts. Um, um, Rob says Trump is starting to point out that the Fed has been the enemy since its inception. Uh, yeah, but how can the Fed? First of all, I agree with that. But second of all, how can the Fed be the enemy um, by being too loose or too tight on monetary policy at the same time? I mean, you be you can you can have the opinion that the Fed. Uh, is an institution that has done more bad than good if you believe that in general it has been too loose on monetary policy and it has helped um, politicians sustain an unsustainable situation having to do with fiscal policy, which is a very good argument. But you can't believe both of them at the same time. So Trump cannot believe at the same time that Fed is not a good institution because it has been too loose with its monetary policy, um, you know, before and too tight now, uh, because you know both can't be can't be true. As simple as that, Rob. So yes, we can have the argument that the Fed, you know, has done more bad than good since its inception, and you know it's a valid argument. Uh, but Trump cannot claim that uh, by by you know blaming the Fed, uh, you know, for two contradicting things at the same time. Okay, back to the charts. Now uh, we were monitoring this bear flag, you know. On, on Friday, whenever it wasn't, they were saying that I believe that you know we're, we're headed lower here in gold. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start from the metals and you know go through the whole complex you know indices, effects, uh, uh, whatever. Of course, Blake hasn't covered. So if you want to you know ask any questions as as always, uh, yeah, we will go over WDI. I see Gerald asking about uh, WDI. We will uh, visit that as well. So gold, uh, obviously, you know it, it followed exactly the path of. Uh, what we were expecting. I mean, I was expecting a rejection from 61.8. We made it a little bit higher, like three, four dollars higher. Now we're de depreciating towards 1280 once again. Uh, 1280, of course, can prove to be a support once again, as you see in the recent past since the end of last year. 1280 has been 
multiple times a support level every single time it you know it, it successfully managed to uh, to hold price will it do it again no idea uh, but I can tell you one thing for sure if we do break below 1280 as well uh, you know uh, we are going to be finding ourselves at 1260 1265 quite soon after that because you can be certain about one thing as coach would say <laughs> to quote him exactly there is at least one stop below 1280 and by that we mean there are like thousands and thousands of stops in long positions or uh, limit orders to go short below below 1280. And trust me, when those get triggered, uh, that's probably going to accelerate the medals uh, losses to the downside quite fast. And exactly the same thing applies to silver, having to do with this 1280, 129, uh, sorry, 1480, 1490 area, previous rectangles resistance. Uh, now acting as support, we visited that multiple times. It has held in every single occasion, but uh, if and once we break below that area, uh, silver is also going to be gone. Uh, it's going to be moving lower quite fast after that for the same exact reason I described, um, uh, you know, about uh, gold. A lot of stop losses must be there. A lot of limit orders must, must be set there. And, you know, once, uh, you know, that uh, that that level is, is broken, all of them will be triggered. Um, you know, brief outlook of the rest of the medals. Uh, platinum is pulling back. I think it's, it's a better idea of have a, having a look at the Platinum on the daily chart because we actually drew there several days ago that, there you go, that we should have seen a pullback, which it actually happened. And, you know, if the bullish case scenario is to play out, uh, this 875 level has to hold. As you see, and I, I very much like seeing Confluences like that, intra-market confluences, let's let's call them. What I'm trying to say here is the following. Platinum is almost at a critical support at the same time that gold is almost at a critical support at the same time that silver is sitting on critical support. What this tells me is that this, you know, we are very, very close to a do or die area for the metal complex. So if you if you believe them, that metals are heading higher from here, you know, this is the place you should be buying them. Exactly, this is the place and time you should be buying them. Uh, on the other hand, you know, and, and you know, you know when you're wrong. I mean, you will have a quite a tight stop loss. On the other hand, if these levels break, uh, then you know we failed and we're headed, you know, lower. That's it. As simple as that. Now, palladium is actually not being uh, driven by the same factors that the rest of the markets I showed. Are same with copper. That's why I left them, you know, after making that synopsis. Now, um, palladium likely seems to be in a triangle here, which tells me that it should move lower towards, you know, the next objective, objective, which is 1265. It's a decent scenario, decent probability scenario. And copper, on the other hand, still consolidating. You know, you can view this as a bull flag that has been broken, retested, and the market is coiling before we head higher. Uh, there is also, you know, you can view it, you know, on the shorter term chart as a, you can see it here, as a triangle, we're coiling within it. If we, in any case, if we break above like 297, 298, we should be headed quite higher. Uh, first objective after that is going to be, uh, you know, depends on how you want to draw it. You can take extensions from this correction lower, you can take extensions from that correction lower. Regardless, you know, we should be headed higher um, above three to begin with. Uh, and if you have a look at it on the daily chart, I think we can easily end up extending towards this confluence of resistances at 315. So, you know, this concludes the revision having to do with the medals. We can now visit crude. Now, uh, crude pulling back from this area. Uh, is crude broken? Not yet. Um, why? Let's go down to the four hour chart. There we go. Simply because so far this corrective move doesn't have impulsive characteristics. I see a little expanding triangle here. Now, if I see an acceleration lower and the break below 63, everything changes. But so far, this looks to me like a consolidation. So I wouldn't be ruling out another push to the upside. I, bottom line, I wouldn't be advocating anybody trying to sort it here because you might be near a short-term low. Um, I would definitely wait for more evidence. 
Um, you think there's a few buy stops, Steve, uh, above 64, 55, 62? Several. Several. Yes. You and, think and, they're going to let them make and, money? And, and by the way, this is coming from me, which if you've been monitoring the webinar, I am short. Uh, yeah. I am short one third at 63.50 and one third at 64. So I'm currently in the money um, at you know two thirds of a full position. And you know, despite being short, I'm telling you that I don't see the price action I would want to be seeing in order for me to uh, you know to get uh, satisfied satisfied that you know this is a, a real breakdown and a real uh, you know long term longer term pullback okay okay well uh, steve this is a teachable moment so you're you're short um you don't have conviction yet why stay short uh that's that's what i wanted to say before you asked the question actually i mean while you were asking the question i'm actually contemplating i'm thinking of booking the one third of the position i'm short from 64 so i can book some profits here and uh Keep my powder dry because let me be clear, and I've said it before, I am expecting crude to top rather soon. So even if we see another push higher, which still looks like a likely scenario, I still want to keep building a short position in crude towards 66. So what I'm thinking of doing is like booking that one third of the short I have from 64, which is okay, an okay profit and uh, nothing to write home about for sure. And this will give me more uh, dry powder to you know short at at higher levels. Uh, well, the on the last other hand, time you wrote a letter, so you know I'm saying you says nothing to write home about. I, uh, probably when I was at my <laughs> teens. At summer camp when you were yeah. away at summer camp. Ma, teens hello, or something mother. like that. Yeah. Hello, father. How are things in Camp Granada? Is that one? <laughs> Uh, Hamid says, where do you feel it's going? Uh, I meant the metals gold 1280 uh, lower or higher. Um, uh, Hamid, um, as I said before, 1280 is a key level for gold. Uh, as 1480 is a key level for silver, uh, as 725 is a key level for uh, platinum. So bottom line, if these levels break, which might do at the same day, because you know we're testing all of them at the same time, more or less, uh, I think that all of those metals are going lower. Uh, but, you know, I wouldn't rule out a breakdown from, um, uh, sorry, a rebound from those levels, which means that, you know, we're going to be at least range bound. Okay. So, you know, monitor closely 1280 because, you know, that's going to be the tell. Um, sorry, coach, what were you saying before? Little nice reversal so far, by the way, in the S&P, of course, extremely early in the day, extremely on the four hour chart here. Um, I'm still monitoring this ascending wedge. Blake saw the same thing. Um, nothing to add here. I mean, we haven't seen what I said on Friday still applies. I mean, we haven't seen any uh, any real movement uh, since then. Um, a nice rollover, though, and if it maybe negates it. It is. But on the other hand, so far, this price action, you know, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's 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 just a short consolidation for the time being. Um, let me see. Steve, hi. Tell your opinion about Aussie Kiwi, Irina says. Absolutely. Um, let's have a look at about it, and then I'm going to tell you about my other trades. So Aussie Kiwi, uh, first of all, holding up very nicely. I mean, we've had literally almost no pullbacks since we broke above this descending wedge. Uh, that's an extremely bullish sign. Second observation here uh, to begin with on the four-hour chart. RSI working off oversold condition, overbought conditions, sorry, as you see here. Uh, but, you know, so far, um, you know, it's just that, you know, working out of overbought conditions. Uh, so it's, it's holding up very nicely. Um, even if we get a pullback from here, I think that, you know, at 1.054, we should find buying interest once again. Now, the next upside objective is, uh, you know, the area between 1.065 and 1.067. Bottom line, 
I remain bullish in the short to medium term, even if we have like, if, even if we see, which, you know, is likely to happen at some point, like a short term pullback. So I think that the upside for Rosy Kiwi is not over yet. We might see some short term reaction. Uh, but I do think that the path of least uh, resistance in the medium term remains um, higher. And you can also clearly see that, in com- you know, if you compare any Aussie um, pair with the equivalent Kiwi pair, you can see, you know, very different price action between them. Um, Aussie is showing much, much stronger lately uh, than Kiwi does. Uh, Aussie yen, CAD yen. Yeah, CAD yen is one I wanted to, to speak about. I actually wrote about it in the chat room early today. And guess what I was showing in the chat room? This thing. This little pennant here saying that, listen, I think that CAD yen is ready to make the next move. We broke above this inverted head and shoulders formation. We're now consolidating in a little pennant. Uh, we were still in the pennant when I wrote that. And I think, you know, it looks good for a move higher. The inverted head and shoulders formation target is exactly as you see here at 86. And as you see, we are indeed breaking above this uh, pennant. And I think we are on our way to the next objective, which is 85. Okay. So I think that the Cadian trade is, looks really nice. I'm probably going to be uh, moving my stop loss to break even, um, perhaps even today. So Cadian looks good. Uh, let's have a look at the Ozyen that you asked about. There it is. Aussie yen looks good as well, because as you see, this little corrective move here uh, might even be over. I mean, at the worst case scenario, I expected like a a little bit of a deeper pullback towards this area. We might not even see that happen. Regardless, as long as we remain above 79.60, let's say, uh, Aussie yen looks good to the upside for at least one more leg uh, higher to the upside. The next objective is the 78.6 of this uh, move lower, which comes at 81. Zero five, so Aussie yen looks very decent as well. Um, USDZR, I can tell you in advance before I pull the chart that the situation with USDZR is quite complicated because we had this break higher from this um, from this triangle here, uh, and we did see an initial push higher. We retested the 61.8 and we got rejected from there. Now. Does that turn me bearish? No, it doesn't because we still trade above this triangle. But one thing is for sure, I don't like this price action. I mean, uh, USDZ does not seem to be having any momentum to go either higher or lower. I would still favor the upside, you know, judging from this chart, but I wouldn't be getting involved with it unless, you know, we see some momentum coming back uh, in this market. So that's what I think about USDZ. Bottom line, I think there are better opportunities out there you should probably be looking for something else to trade at the moment. Um, okay, let me see what else we have to talk about. Uh, Blake covered, uh, Euro covered pound. Yeah, let me go through the USD Swiss again. It's one of the charts I showed once again. I'm a little bit uh, stuck on this pair because I think that it still looks very nice. Once it gives the technical signal, uh, here it is, use the Swiss, still trading perfectly within this uh, channel and still, for some reason, makes me want to trade it to the short side. Uh, I'm not short yet because, as you see, there's this very, very nice uh, support area at parity. But I do believe that a break below parity should be good enough for at least 100 pips to the downside to retest uh, this low, at the very least, at the very least, probably will be good enough for a move even lower than that. Okay, uh, but at the very least, I would expect a 100 pip continuation uh, if and when that happens. I think it's a you know very decent probability that it's going to happen. Okay, now uh, Blake mentioned the Nordic currencies before, so um, let's have a look at USD Nok. USD knock. I'm still long just one third of a position here. Um, as long as we remain above 8, 840, I have no reason to to want to be short. That's a major level. If we go back to the daily chart, I've shown that chart to you multiple times. You can see how major of a level that is. Um, I'm monitoring this descending channel. If we if we see a break above it, uh, I'm definitely going to be adding to my position now. 
Um, I'm probably going to be adding to my position if we also, you know, drip lower towards towards 8.40 and I see a nice reaction from there as well. So I just have, you know, a small position to uh, to make me, uh, you know, monitor it very closely. And I would be happy to add to that either lower if we see a nice reaction or higher if we break above this descending channel. That's exactly my viewpoint on that. Now, having to do with the other popular Nordic currency, which, which is the USD SEC, here it is. I expected a reaction when we retested that. We got that. Let me delete it. Uh, we got that react reaction, and now we are within a triangle. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see a resumption higher from this triangle. Okay, uh, we're closer to th to the triangle support than to resistance. I have to admit that. Having said that, um, you know, I would I wouldn't be doing much, but I wouldn't be short for sure. I mean, usually this sec has all has also broken above a, a major formation, and until proven otherwise, I think we have to respect the upside more than the potential of a reversal lower platinum as well. Uh, I did cover platinum, um, but okay, I can show you again uh, very fast. What's this area as support? You see there is a nice rectangle here, 875 area, very strong support. As long as we remain above that, you have to respect the potential for more upside in platinum. If we do break below 875 again, uh, I think you should be very, very careful following that. Okay. Uh, Coach, by the way, do we have an interview uh, today? Yes, Steve, we Oops. do, and, and he's here. Ah, okay. Very nice. Um, okay, now let me see if we have any more questions. Last chance for questions, people. I'll give you one minute. Let me see what else I want to cover. Not much has moved today, so, you know, um, Bitcoin, Ethereum consolidating the recent gain, so nothing much to add uh, there. I'm still uh, along my last part of my... What is your, your view on DAX? I'm actually long the DAX. Uh, I, I mentioned that on Friday. I'm I'm long the DAX, and the reason is uh, okay. I put it up on the wrong chart. Here it is. The reason is you can see it here that we've broken above this uh, flag here. So I'm long the DAX. I'm in the money, and I'm looking for at least a shorter move towards the 161.8 percent extension and this trend line resistance. So in the short term, I do like I do like DAX to uh, the upside. Did you say US index is from down? Uh, I said that there was a small reaction um, on the four-hour chart uh, lower, but we're still consolidating near the highs. And of course, the you know the chances remain that the S&P is going to push higher towards the all-time highs until we you know we see something that says the opposite. Okay. Uh, any ideas on USDTL? What is that? Sorry, can Hamid, can you give me the ticker again? Because there is no ticker with two words. Two. Ah, Turkish lira. Okay, okay. Uh, sure, let's have a look at it. Not much that has been happening here, but let's have a look at that. Um, there you go. It's been pushing towards the highs, but keep in mind that you know this move higher does not look impulsive to me yet. So what's this area currently testing uh, resistance? If we break above that, the next area of interest is this one. Okay, at, you know, close to six. Now let's also flip this. There you go. Let's also flip this. Thirty-eight point two, a little bit higher than than this this level. So, you know, I would be a little bit careful here because the move to the upside looks correct to me. So perhaps there is more downside before higher. Okay. From here, from there, you know, I, I, you know, I can't speculate exactly from where because keep in mind that this is also very heavily manipulated from the central bank. So you have to take that into account as well. That's one of the reasons why we've had such an orderly move uh, to the upside. Can you explain uh, why DAX rallies despite Euro strength, whereas FTSE 
is suffering from cable strength. Um, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to cover that, and you know, then we'll pass it to coach to start the interview. The DAX is not doing well uh, despite euro strength. Um, I mean, let me say it oppositely. The DAX would be doing it. We would be doing even better if euro was not appreciating. Okay, so it's not that the euro strengthening does not have an effect on the DAX. It's just that you cannot see it because they they both are moving higher at the same time. So it looks like they don't have an invertly, you know, an inverted correlation. Um, but trust me, if the euro was flat or if it was dropping. Um, you know, of course, if it was dropping, uh, not for a reason that would have to do with, um, you know, the safety of the system or, you know, any big uh, issues with the Eurozone, in which case we might have been seeing both the Euro and the DAX uh, depreciate. But, you know, you can be certain about one thing. If the Euro uh, was flat or depreciating at the moment, the DAX would have been performing even better. So trust me, there is a negative effect from the euro uh, appreciating to the DAX, but it's not enough to keep it from appreciating at the moment. The DAX looks quite good in the short term. As I showed you, we had a textbook bull flag, which has now been broken to the upside. And I even gave you an upside uh, objective. So thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. Coach, enjoy the interview. Thank you, Steve. Okay, Mr. Privateer, welcome to the face. I'm now making you the presenter. Looking forward to meeting you and want to thank you for taking time out of the slowest trading day of the year to join us. Welcome to Faith, Privateer. Here you go. Drop down menu for mic, for screen. Yeah, see, should be on. Can screen. you see me? Can see you, can hear you. Very nice to meet you, my trading warrior brother. Nice to meet you, Dale. I'll have to say uh, straight away, uh, I appreciate uh, what you do and what you say, um, your consistency. I think I mentioned to you, I, I don't believe uh, in in God or whatnot, but I do really, really enjoy uh, the way you start your day on a positive note with consistency and your value system. So thank you for that, uh, even oh, though you and I diverged a little bit there, but yeah. I appreciate that. I bet we don't diverge about the perseverance that Tiger Woods showed in his career. And as a trader, privateer, I, I, I bet you could really understand how you have to live through adversity and have the perseverance to win again. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I heard Blake earlier say he was in tears. A lot of us in the trading community can relate to that because uh, in my mind, you know, what is trading? It's basically a series of failures and how you get up off the canvas wow. that gives you a career in trading. Yeah. Um, so we all have to be Rocky Balboa, right, buddy? You kind of do. You kind of yeah. do. Uh, and let me tell you my story. And one Before of the you do, I, I'm curious, and maybe a lot of uh, the viewers don't know, what is a privateer? Ah, uh, yeah. Private, uh, what is privateer FX or what is a privateer? No, what is a privateer? Because obviously you selected that handle for a reason of what it represents, right? So what is it? Yeah. I have to say smarter guys than I selected it. Uh, okay. when I, we've, we've, got, we've, got four, <laughs> we've got four guys here. The guy in Dublin selected it. He's got, a, he's got an acute sense of humor. I believe he says it's something like, we are not pirates, but we are privateers, and it's some sort of British Anglo angle. I, I, I wish I could give yeah. you a better answer. Okay, because most people would associate it with piracy, but what it yeah. is, I think, uh, and you could check with your partner, it's uh, someone who had their own ship, and you know, I tell all the people I mentor, uh, even though I share ideas we're all captains of our own ship but yeah. i think it's a independent ship owner who uh goes out and does Searches commerce yeah. i think before they call them uh merchants you know merchant shipping yes they were I privateers right nick you might right even uh, if you're not right oh, I'm the treasure that. is the aspect right okay so you're seeking treasure in the fx market as a trader that's a great handle 
that's that's basically it um so, so the, tell us, yeah go so go ahead back to your story and tell us about your treasure hunt yeah yeah i'll tell you about my journey because a lot of people listen to me at the european open but there is a group of us there's a fella um again who's smarter than myself who trades uh for the same family i trade for we have we run managed accounts for one of i would say the more famous american families out there i don't want to share the name okay for their sake uh they are very very old-fashioned discreet group of people so we'll just you leave know, it someone that once, someone once told me privateer and i even had to really worry about it and i certainly didn't take their advice with you know being on social media but uh he said dale make your money in a closet yeah or the nail that sticks out gets hammered was what i told him <laughs> When you have them. as many of them as me, so you have privateerisms. Yes, exactly, exactly. Anyway, so there's a group of us. Um, it's not even really clear where we're going to go with this privateer, but what we do do with it is there are a team of risk takers in America, and there are is a team of risk takers over here in Europe. And one of the reasons I put my ideas up and I do my morning resume is after 30 years, I don't like to listen to other people, um, but the young guys in our firm do like to listen to me or are told to perhaps listen to me or whatnot. So this is a really good framework for, you can hear me speak, I don't have to hear you speak, which just usually annoys me, um, and you can see what I'm thinking real time. And so this is why we have Privateer for now. I don't know where it's going. Um, so that's just a little bit. A lot of people are like, well, what are you going to do with privateer? I have no idea. Uh, well, okay. Right now. All right. right so now, when you were a young guy, like the guys you talk to now, who are yeah. you listening to? Yeah. I uh, started in 91. So I was a, a New York City uh, market maker in European currencies. Uh, I worked um, for three different banks, was fired from each of those jobs. Uh, why? And I worked, and I worked during a period. Well, I was, I'm, I'm quite not, I'm quite bad at following rules. Um, I'm a bit of a uh, rule breaker, law breaker. Oh. I wouldn't say law breaker, but I just don't like to be told what to do. Um, and yeah, compliance you know, can be uh, hand uh, restrictive. Yeah, and then the position limits, and you know, yeah. and I was a smart ass. I was basically a muppet, basically. But you could survive back in the '90s as a muppet because of the spreads, right? So everyone thought they were great traders. Yeah, um, you're right. Because we had massive spread back then. And so I was a market maker and I became like a lot of market makers back then. If you work for the right shops, I did some very, very serious volume at some very, very key times. Like one of the reasons I became somewhat known was again, pure luck. I got paid at the all time highs in, in Mark Lira. I don't know if people probably don't even remember this, but this is before the Euro. Yeah. Um, made a million bucks, pure luck, you know, made some price out of my ass. The guy pays me. It's the all time high. Um, but those are the kind of moments where you de develop a little bit of a reputation and you see some more flow. And and I always consistently made money, but I also always consistently broke limits, uh, rules, overnight limits. I was just basically. Uh, you know, sort of a bit rebellious uh, during that time. Okay, the, you know, I have a question for you, and uh, I'm yeah. kind of a maverick myself. But you know what? Um, the market can humble anybody. And if you're uh, the type of person that, you know, breaks rules, breaks limits, uh, it's kind of hard to drive a taxi cab, even if you're a great driver in New York and not get a traffic ticket. Didn't you have a traffic ticket uh, with that type of, psyche and mindset uh have you ever blown out any have you ever had a bad year in a day absolutely during those days my var my value at risk during the day was absurd uh, but of course again it got obfuscated by the by the spread so okay i always all made right. money all right uh, so what people are what so what privateer is talking about is uh during you know pre-internet where everything decimalized and everything uh and when you used to have even open outcry uh brokers could make money they were you know a quarter spread there were bigger spreads and uh a lot of guys got rich and then when their decks were taken away 
uh, to stay in the business, they had to learn how to be right in the markets. And, and many weren't able to make that transition. Sounds like you were able to. Yeah, I'll, I'll segue into many is a, is one of the greatest understatements of all time, Dale. Nine, 99%, um, 99% failed. I can think of 100 guys uh, that I shared those New York years with. Yeah. Five are dead. Um, yeah. yeah. 90 are out of the business and there's maybe four of us left. And what's odd is the four of us that are left weren't really the heroes. We were guys who just worked our asses off and kept learning our craft and kept failing and then fixing it and then failing and then fixing it. So imagine me, I've been fired from every job I've ever had in trading. And some guy, some guy calls me up and he goes, listen, New York's not too healthy for you. You should move to Europe and we should trade PA together. And we'll leverage our money 40 times and we'll just sort of travel around the world trading PA. And again, Wow, I was I was so stupid that I thought I could do it. Um, you know, I didn't realize how hard that would be without any spread and pure alpha, et right. cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the guy who asked me to do this turned out to be um, kind of a superstar, probably the single greatest pound for pound trader uh, I've ever met. And he, this is the guy who really taught me my craft. So I just wow, you got lucky. More. I did get lucky, and this is part of everyone's journey. There is some luck. Uh, okay, I, I call it providence. It is, it is. And if you surround yourself by great people, which I try and do, you can kind of make your own luck in a sense, you know, like, yeah. you know, there's it. a reason, there's a reason this guy and I, this guy and I were friends, we shared humor, we shared a lot of things, but also like, I was no, I was no dummy, right? The guy was one of the best traders in the world and you want to learn from these type of guys. Yeah. Um, and to make a long story a little bit shorter, so I moved to Europe, no papers, no insurance, nothing, $40,000 to my name. We leveraged this money up um, 40 times. And then over the next three years, we're kind of traveling around the world. So every, every nine months, I'd move to a different city, Paris and Biarritz, Singapore, Geneva. And he was also moving around, London, Tokyo, uh, Toronto, um, and what an adventure! Yeah, and he basically taught me risk reward and how to trade, and the key features in being a professional trader. Which number one is never lose your seat. So risk yeah. is premium, and you can imagine when you're 40 times leveraged, you can never make a mistake, never. So we sort of developed a system where we would get into trades what we would call free trades, similar to what you do, I think, Dale, you're a Forex stop hunter. We see these weak parts in the weak points in the market. And if you just get long or short at these weak points, you can kind of get a free trade. And so if your downside is close to zero and you have the balls to hold it, you can make a fair bit of money. And of course, it was a lot easier to make this money pre-algo and pre this volatility, you can't really do that. but we did that for three years and we made a fair we made a fair bit of money um you know double triple quadrupled our money um including our lifestyles which was just all on a credit card we didn't have bank accounts we just had one visa and then we would pay cash nine months cash in advance for rent and just move from place to place but then eventually uh you know some people kind of saw us and they asked us to do a hedge fund and this is where also luck and and falling down and getting up, getting up works again. So we took another partner. There were three of us and we started this hedge fund with a million bucks and all these people who said to us, oh, you guys should start a fund, you know, and, and you're pretty known now and you're a known commodity. Then we asked them for money. They all said no. Every single one of them said, no, your track record's not long enough. You don't have enough under management. You're too young. Because mind you, I was I was 30, and these other Muppets, they were 27. So we were youngsters at the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, action, actions speak louder than words. Easy, easy to say, you know, well, you should start a fund, we'll participate. Yeah. Exactly. Cutting the check is another thing, isn't it? That's exactly it. But here's the thing. Again, it was part of our stubbornness and part of our just general stupidity. We just believed that this was going to work. So we just knocked on 
250 doors. And the first 249 doors all said no. Uh -huh. It took a year. We spent, I don't know, 70 grand of travel and entertainment in London, New York, Geneva, Zurich, Tokyo, um, where we had connections, of course. We were all bankers. And these guys who I were with were even somewhat famous. Um, they all said no. And then one guy finally said yes. And he was like from a biggish name. At the point where we were like, this is, Ready you to know, give up. Yeah, yeah, just about to give up. And to the point where, you know, you're at the Sanderson Hotel. It's a Thursday night. You're at the Sanderson Hotel in London with your partner. The third partner doesn't even want to come to this meeting because he knows <laughs> the guy's going to say no. He can't handle rejection anymore. Yeah, you know, and we probably had too many mojitos. We, you know, typical night at the Sanderson. And we show up like a big groggy eight o'clock in the morning at one of these London shops. And this guy just goes, all right, you're done here. And then it just cascaded. Uh, and for seven or eight years, we, we ended up raising close to a billion dollars. And I'm not saying that because uh, blah, 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 billion dollars. What I want to say is over that time frame, it was, again, a period, a series of massive failures. So you learn the most from your failures. Okay. You do. And you do. And this is. This is, so what I wanna, go ahead. So, uh, this is what I want to go ahead. This is what I want to tell them. the internet here because right, I'm now ahead. getting a lot of people who are coming onto my Twitter saying, "Oh, can you help me with this? Can you, can you train me with this?" And I want to say that number one, Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours works for some, but it took me 30,000 hours, you know, yeah. to, to become great at this. I've never heard of that 10,000 hour thing. Yeah, he 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 basically said in order to become, you know professional quality at anything you got to put in 10,000 hours which is basically so, five years at 10 okay. hours a day all right screen time yeah and you and can't so, learn experience it only happens with the passing of time and living through correct stuff. correct okay. and as you said your failures teach you far more than than your successes but you can imagine again here come the failures again so you you, you do great with four bucks you can trade eight bucks and then you got to trade 50 bucks then you got to learn to trade 100 bucks and then you got to learn to trade 200 bucks you have no idea, and, and what works on 10 million certainly doesn't work on 50 million as well, and certainly doesn't work at all on 200 million, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, it's these series of failures which teach you how to change, how to evolve, uh, how to get this thing done, and it's incredibly hard. Like everyone glamorizes this business on the internet, uh, on the yeah. Instagrams, on the things. You what mean I'm the ten thousand dollar millionaires that rent a Ferrari and a private yeah. plane and are sitting Dale. on a beach with a drink? Them? Hell, you you and I are putting nails through our temples when we see that bullshit. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. But people believe it, and it's sad, you know, because I get I get direct messages from people all over the world now, and I and I keep trying to tell them, dude, you have no idea what you're getting into, you know. You can't just start this at 41 years old and then think you're going to be a millionaire at 42, starting with $2,000 and zero experience. So the reason I'm telling my story is it is freaking hard. It is really, really hard. And it's the a business tough way to earn an easy buck. Someone wants yes, to. Yes. Yes. And I have two daughters, and there's two things I won't let them do. They won't become ballet dancers because I don't like the whole <laughs> ballet industry. And they yeah, can't hurt their toes, man. That's you don't right. want your daughter. <laughs> That's right. And they cannot become traders okay. because it's too hard. It's too hard for the normal person because you have to live this abnormal life and learn to react to things in an opposite fashion that's normal. Do they have to marry a doctor or a lawyer privateer? No, they can do whatever. Those are the only two rules. And I guess they okay, probably – no <laughs> prostitution, I guess, third rule. <laughs> You are a character, man. I'm so <laughs> glad I reached out to you. All right. So, uh, you know, we've been talking here. Uh, what a great story and how fortunate you were because you talk about, you know, the trading floors aren't there. That was a great place to rub elbows with pros and hang out with pros and all the charlatans on the Internet. And, you know, you uh, compared and even though it was a tough road, at least it was a road that wasn't a detour to hell. And no, uh, a lot of people, you know, uh, you know, turn, you know, buy. I will sell you the secret of trading, 
for five thousand dollars you know yeah. and you just told everyone what the secret is hard work yeah. hard work yeah. and stubbornness and you know every time you get knocked down every time you're in the fetal position in the dark on a Saturday morning, because you can't believe just what happened, the illogical move that just happened, or they ran your stops, your 80 points in the money, and now you've scratched it. All of these things um, are real, and people need to get that through their head and be super, super careful. How do you protect um, your health, privateer? Uh, you talk about all this stress, and we know what stress does to the mm -hmm. body. So, yeah. you know, I think that's an important thing, too, because, you know, I had a major health issue, right? So, yeah, I heard, uh, that. I heard about that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what do you do? Do you train uh, when the mar you, you make sure that you live a, uh, you know, an athletic-type lifestyle um, to be in a peak-performing state, which is difficult to do every day? Uh, what's your routine? Yeah, I, I think I again should tell the full story because I could tell you the varnished story and the beautiful story that I'm in peak condition and I train every day. In yeah. my 20s, I used alcohol okay. uh, to run away from my problems. In right. my 30s, it was less, um, but still, uh, and it wasn't until my 40s that I realized that the most sensible way for me personally to survive this business was to do fitness in nature. So I, of course, live in Switzerland. Beautiful. Um, I, uh, I take the road bike out, you know, these 10 speed bikes and yeah. I ride up, I ride uphill in them. That's what I like to do. I like riding up the mountain. Um, it's a great metaphor for pushing the rock and for trading. Yeah. And I also ski, but when I ski, I don't ski downhill anymore. Cause when you're in Switzerland, that gets quite boring. Um, I walk uphill. So again, I do ski touring. Um, and oftentimes I do this at sort of 5 a.m. So pre-sunrise and you want to get to the top of the mountain at the sunrise, quite invigorating. Uh, it's the one time of my day where I'm not thinking about Euro dollar or implied right. vol or when ES is going to turn or OPEC cool. this week. Uh, and that's the way I survive the stress. But also, it's and again, it's a little bit easier for me at 50 because, you know, I kind of have the fuck you money now. So it, my trading now is just also a little bit different. And I'm not saying that to be like a jerk. I don't want to be a jerk. I just want to be honest with people that um, it's hard. And like, and I couldn't have done that in my 30s and 20s because it was a 20-hour day. The phone rang all night. I took fills at 3 a.m., you couldn't get up at five and go on your bike because you were smoked. You were exhausted the whole time. For decades, I was exhausted. Okay. So that's I just want to throw story. that reality check out there. To okay, that, that's a great story. So um, uh, really uh, great content in this interview. So uh, you chose to show the S&P chart. Were you yeah. long? Uh, have you ever seen, and you've been around for a while, a market break? the way it did in December, the worst year since 1931, worst December since 1931, and rebound with such magnitude without one correction. No, well, I mean, we did see it obviously in, in seven, 2007, 2008, and, and this is the story I'm gonna tell today. Uh, I'm of the camp that we're, this is thin air, this has to turn. I agree with your colleagues that we're waiting for this event. And until this event happens, your yen crosses, and I hope you guys are right on your Aussie yen cross trade, but I'd be a bit nervous being long Aussie yen, being long any risk metric here, because I do believe okay. it's in thin air. Um, let me just, I guess you can see my screen. I'm, I'm on the weekly here. 2925 was a number of, uh, 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 an excellent wave guy put out, I uh, guess I had last week. So watch that number. Go I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back, and I believe a few of our viewers, actually most of our viewers or listeners, probably have never even heard of Paul Tudor Jones. Oh, I, I, he's my hero. All the big money's made at the turns. Of course, you and I know and, him. He is our hero. He's our Michael Jordan. He's our Wilt Chamberlain. And uh, our, and Blake trades for Gellos, and Gellos, uh, uh, they trade Tudor's funds. Nice, nice. So you guys know him, but the youngsters probably don't know him. But he made a load of money uh, in '86 with this same type of idea in a sense. So we're looking at the weeklies now and mm. we're going to go to the, we're going to go backwards now in time to the last time there was a turn. So I'm going back, I'm going back 2007. 
So you see up here, 2007, we traded up to 1564, and we had this move right. from 1233 to 1564, this 20% move in a straight line, and nice. that was July 2007. And then we okay. had this massive move down, very similar to our December move. If you think okay. even in percentage terms, that's 20%. It's 15 to 13. It's 200. Okay. Uh, it's 200. Yeah, it's 200 S and P points at 15. Yeah, it's it's 16 percent. Right. And then you see this magical mystery tour here, where we just <laughs> clip the high. Yeah. We just clip the high, and then you get your turn. I'm of the idea that I'm not sure we're going to clip this high. So now let's go back to present day, all the way back to present day. So we've had this move up, this insane move up. We've had this move down, and now this move down, the second move down in December. I'm of the mind that we could barely clip this 29.50. Okay. And up at 29.50, I'm on red alert. Any negative sign, I pile in. But I have a feeling because of the Barron's cover and because of basically the general, I would say the general flock right now has just given up. And everyone's like, well, it's just going to float higher. Well, it's going to go higher. The Fed's gone dovish. Da, da, yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. Oil's going Trade to 80. Trade deals happening. Da, da, yeah. da, da, da. Yeah. And okay. so, uh, but but in fact, that doesn't matter. My, my point right. is right now, and in the, even my, my morning video today, you know, we run a tactical book or I run a tactical book and a directional book. My tactical book is supposed to make money every day. And I make money sort of 58 out of 60 months like clockwork in my tactical book. And that's small money that's supposed to smooth out the directional book, which pays the bills. And as you know, for someone who's been around and for all you youngsters listening out there, the four days a year, the four obvious days of year is how the pros make their money. That's where we get paid. When cable broke 190, I repeat, 190 back in the mid 2000s, and Euro went down from 160, that's when we got paid. The rest of the time, we were just breaking even, making small profits, not losing our seat. This is gonna be one of those times where when this turns, you just have to be ready for it. So you're just on high alert. You're not fading this, or if you are gonna fade it, like today I'll be selling sort of between 29.18 and 29.23, kind of what I would consider a stretch high. If I don't get paid, I don't care. Um, if I do get paid, I will then trade it on the short side for a better average to try and scratch some cash in the S&P book. But what I'm waiting for is a daily, now we're in the dailies here, is a daily move that's going to tell me something. This day here, March 22nd, is one of those days. We almost bearish engulfed. Okay. This would be a day that I would be like, oh shit, something's about to happen. And then I would look around, see what the story is, and decide whether to pile in. I'm waiting for this type of day, and it could be a long-tailed extension high, close at the same, you know, doji, tombstone doji. You it want a could, negative candle to tell you. Yeah, or it could be the Uber IPO. So Uber IPOs, and what everyone smashes it. What is it? Uh, that is a good question. I don't even know. It's coming up because I've seen it in the, in the media. Okay. Let me see what they say. It's, it's soon. Okay. Or it could be... Um, it could be Google getting sued by the Europe by the Europeans. We all saw that in the FT this weekend. There's now it's a tsunami of litigation. I stole that headline from one of my news feeds. Um, everyone is now suing Google in Europe. And why does that matter if Google turns and then we all start hating Facebook again and the whole fang complex turns? That yeah. could be the catalyst. Fang, hey, Fang has had one of the weakest responses. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they they were broken, and they've come back a lot, 61.8, 78.6, but not close to making new highs like the S&Ps. And the but NASDAQ you know, is close to new all-time highs. Yeah, but as you know, like a weak return is another sort of signal that we're running out of strength, but it's yeah. not the signal we need to hammer it. And Got this it. is the difference between sort of senior traders and junior traders. Junior traders are always trying to hammer it. We are paid to wait. And 
imagine these stories, and if you imagine enough of these stories, one of them actually typically comes true. And then you're like, oh my God, I've been thinking about that story of the 10 stories I've been thinking of. Mm -hmm. Slap yourself in the face, put on your big boy boots, and hammer it. But until then, either don't trade, which is like what a lot of the pros are doing right now. The right. risk reward on risk on looks a bit squirrely to us. So we're not Tom super Petty, Tom Petty, the waiting is the hardest part. Yeah, it's so hard, you know, and, and a lot of us, you know, we're addictive personalities and we're workers. Uh, so you got to keep yourself busy. I mean, one of the things I do to keep myself busy is I read. And I don't read technical stuff or autobiographies. Sometimes I just read a book with loads of sex in it and like some murders. Uh, <laughs> And it just keeps me entertained and away from yeah. getting into trouble uh, trading dollar CAD between 133 figure 10. Yeah. Anyway, I'll tell you, I, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm uh, you know, what a great interview. And, and, you know, what's great about it is when you could combine compelling content and having fun at the same time. So, like I said at the beginning of the interview, and you're anonymous to me, you're just Mr. Privateer. FX, you're also now, like it or not, buddy, my trading warrior brother. <laughs> Dale, thanks. I'll let you go on that note. Uh, I appreciate you uh, you finding me. I hope it yeah, was helpful. Buddy. It and, was. It was uh, great. Great story. You got. It. You know what? Here's a suggestion. Let me mentor you. You not only need uh, uh, should read. You know, you love to read books. You have a book in you. Write it. Yeah, I've been told that by a lot of people, but I'm too tired to write too a lazy. book. I know. <laughs> I, I know, man, I know. But you know what? If you really want to pay it forward and reach a lot of people, and I know it's hard work, I've tried it too and have thrown in the towel. I'm kind of like a sprinter. I could write a chapter and that's yeah. it and it's kind of a thesis. But you have a great book to share with people on your journey in trading. Just telling you, I've interviewed over a 1,000 people over the last several years and you have a very good story and it was a pleasure meeting you here's one last thing dale uh and one of the reasons i'm not writing a book anytime soon is and in, i want to get your uh, opinion on this um youngsters don't listen can you comment they don't on even that have, uh, uh i i believe the reason they don't listen is because they only text <laughs> and and texting texting is silent so you know it's the uh, lowest form of communication right so it is and try and have a conversation with them and get them on the phone and there's almost a fear of meeting people in person that they need the protection of a device i couldn't agree more this is one of the okay, great buddy great things we need to fix in our, our society anyway yeah. said enough. I'm an thank you for I'm, your an, time. I'm an open book man as you can see so yeah. i want people to learn from my life because i didn't um anyway buddy <laughs> great meeting you <laughs> good hunting and uh i'm on bear alert and s and p's over the next week or so thank you for thanks. your time thanks dale good luck out there all right, everyone, that's Privateer FX. You could follow him at Privateer FX. I know I'd want to see his uh, videos and uh, pay attention to what this guy is doing. That's a wrap. Remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. You're very welcome, Hammett. You're very welcome, Mark. Everyone loved you, Privateer. And we'll see everyone for Turnaround Tuesday. Adios. Cheers. Ciao. Cheers. Adios, buddy.